Hello, and thank you for joining us today in our study of the book of Galatians. Today we're in Galatians chapter 2. Now, as you come into chapter 2, just a quick reminder of what's taken place in chapter 1. And if you haven't seen the video for chapter 1, you can click on the tab in the upper right-hand corner, and you can go back and look at that video first if you desire. But here in Galatians chapter 2, Paul is going to continue this discussion. In chapter 1, he has given a bit of his history, what brought him to this point, and in that discussion, he's talking about how that he is more concerned with pleasing God than he is with pleasing man. And that emphasis is going to play over into the events of chapter 2 and the things that Paul is going to discuss in chapter 2. This isn't necessarily a change of topic, but instead it is a continuation of this same theme of being more worried about what God thinks than he is about what men think. And that's even going to extend to the apostles. Let's look at what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2. Beginning in verse 1, we read, Then after fourteen years I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and also took Titus with me. And I went up by the revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But from those who seemed to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows per personal favoritism to no man. For those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. I want you to notice several different things that are going to be discussed by Paul in this chapter. The, the first one is, and it's going to harken back to some of the things that we talked about back in the introductory lesson about the 
attitudes that certain people had toward those who were wanting to become Christians, that they had to be like Jews. And Paul is going to talk about in the start of chapter 2 that he did not yield to them for even an hour, as he states in verses 3 through 5. That here you have Titus who is not circumcised, and as such he is not identifiable with the Jews. He has not yielded himself to the lifestyle of the Jews or to the traditions of the Jews. And yet there were those who were trying to say that that's what he needed to do. And he says, we didn't yield to them for even an hour. Now there will be the, would be those who would say, well, you know, you should just go ahead and do it. We know it's not necessary. We know it's not required. Just to keep the peace and to make people happy, you need to just go ahead and go with the flow and do it. Paul says, no. Because that leaves the wrong impression about the freedom that is there in Christ. And the fact that these things are not required. So therefore to act as though they are required or they should be required would be to give people a false impression of what God truly desires. And of what it is that he wants to do. So Paul says not even for an hour did we give heed to this idea that these things were required or were necessary or even that they were important for somebody to do. As a matter of fact, it's going to be brought up again a little bit later. When you begin reading in verse 11 concerning what can only be described as Peter's mistake, because Peter is going to come to Antioch, and the indication is this is in the early days of the church some years before. But he comes to Antioch, and he is happy to go through and do everything with the Gentiles in the way of their traditions and in the way that they normally would. He'll sit and eat with them, he visits with them, he talks with them. But then there are some Jewish brethren that come north to Antioch from Jerusalem, from James. And all of a sudden, when these brethren arrive, Peter stops doing what he was doing. And instead, he separates himself from those Gentile brethren that he has been eating with and working with and enjoying the friendship of and that kind of thing. And now, all of a sudden, he's separating himself to just be with these Jews because he is a Jew. And Paul says in verse 14, I said to Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as the Jews? If it's okay for you to do what the Gentiles do and, and, and to be okay with their lifestyle when the others aren't around, why are others and why are you then going to compel them to try to act like the Jews when the Jews are around? You see, it's not a matter of what is required by God. It is a matter of what certain people have held as their traditions and what it is that's going to make them the most comfortable. But if what is comfortable is not what is commanded, if what we've always done is not what we are supposed to do or, or what it is that has been commanded to do, then we have absolutely no right to say to somebody else, this is what you must do or this is the way you must do it. This is what happens when the Jews try to bind the law. And when you see the law being discussed by Paul here, he's not talking about the law of Christ. He's not talking about the New Testament. What he's talking about is the law of Moses, the Old Testament, and people trying to bind the law of Moses in the days of the New Testament of Christ as being what we have to follow in order to be right with God today. As a matter of fact, Paul is going to make the statement that in, in verse uh, number 16, he says that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Now that doesn't mean we don't have to follow the New Testament. What he's talking about there is the law of the Old Testament, the law that the Jews followed the traditions that the Jews had because of that law. And then he's going to make the statement in verse 20. He says, 
For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am crucified with Christ. It's not me who lives any longer, but Christ who lives in me. In other words, I have seeded what, what I want, what I think is important, what I desire for what Christ wants me to do and who he is and what he commands, that he is the one who lives in me, in the things that I do, in the choices that I make, and in the way in which I live my life. And the rest of my life that I live, Paul says, I live by faith in him because he loved me and gave himself for me. These are some of the things that we see in Galatians 2. And yes, we could go deeper into several different aspects of it. But this, I think, covers the, the basic sentiments of the chapter and allows us to then be able to flesh those things out. And I hope that this is helpful to you and beneficial to you in understanding what Paul teaches. Next time, we'll come back and we'll begin looking at Galatians 3. Thank you so much for watching the video today, and I hope that you'll join us again next time. But until then, have a great day.